All the microbes in the raw milk are actually very beneficial for us. Extremely so and intentionally so. Children that drink raw milk have decreased significantly, 35% decrease in asthma, ear infections, fevers, colds, flu. All those things are associated with uh, the raw milk consumption, not on, just on the farm, but in the city as well. Okay, I am so happy that I finally got the distinguished Mark McAfee to come onto my podcast uh, because I have listened to Mark talk about raw milk uh, for a while, you know, for, from a different, uh, a few different podcasts. And I just thought he was the most dynamic, you know, passionate, articulate person and, and uh, just wealth of information and uh, certainly turned me on to raw milk. And that's what that's the only milk I would drink and, um, and raw kefir and raw cheese and uh, raw cream. And it's, just, it's amazing. So I'm going to let him explain why that's so helpful for you and why, why that's, you know, why you should ditch the pasteurized milk. Uh, so, so Mark, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Well, I am overjoyed, and I don't know how I'm going to come up to rise to the uh, description of my personality here, but we're going to try. We're going to give it a shot. Uh, I am very, very happy to be with you, and and you um, are obviously a distinguished physician and researcher, and you go about healing people in innovative ways. And so I hope to share some things that might be good tools for people to either prevent or augment or facilitate in some way their healing today. Yes, yes, definitely. You know, I recognize the complexity of our body, of our health. So bringing in as many elements as possible, and which includes, you know, stellar nutrition. And um, so then you're going to enlighten us about this very important aspect, which is dairy. Um, so before we do that, I want to give a, a brief overview of, you know, who you are. So the audience have a, you know, a better understanding. So I'm just going to introduce Mark who is a visionary pioneer, CEO, and founder of Raw Farm, which was established in 1998. The company is a leading California and national brand of truly raw dairy products, including milk, butter, cream, kefir, uh, truly raw cheddar cheese, which is delicious, <laughs> and founder and chairman of the Raw Milk Institute, which is a nonprofit organization, and is an internationally recognized speaker and expert with an emphasis on raw milk production standards, gut microbiome, milk genomics, nutritional benefits, food safety, and the medical health benefits of raw unprocessed milk and products. And Mark is deeply involved with raw milk food safety research and is associated with the International Milk Genomics Consortium at UC Davis since 2018, Two peer-reviewed research papers now identify the Raw Milk Institute standards, training, and testing protocols as causing the raw raw meat effect. Uh, since 2014, in the USA, there has been 357% increase in raw milk consumption, with a decrease of 74% of reported illness associated with raw milk. The positive effect has been associated with advances in testing technology and the standards and training developed by Rami and its PhD board of directors. So thousands of farmers have received Rami training on how to produce raw milk for human consumption versus standards for pasteurization. So, um, you know, and then you have, you know, wonderful married life and you've been, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, and I'll, I'll let you go into to, to all that interesting, fun stuff you want to. So um, I want to really deliver the information of, you know, all the misconceptions and myths and and um, and science around raw milk. So maybe I'll ask you about, you know, why so many people are scared of raw dairy and raw milk. Because that's what our culture has educated us to do, to be scared of anything other than pasteurized products. Our medical schools teach that. The, the, the schools in general teach that. That's our culture. But uh, I'll start out with a quote from Dr. Bruce German, who's the founder of the International Milk Genomics Consortium, PhD, um, distinguished PhD uh, at UC Davis. He said, pasteurization, it's an 18th century solution 
to an 18th century problem, we can do a whole lot better. Mm, I love it. <laughs> in the 1800s, we had a big problem um, in all the big, wasn't so much in the small cities, but Philadelphia, Boston, New York, um, England, Russia, downtown, you know, pick your, pick your big town, uh, uh, Stalingrad or whatever it was in Russia, St. Petersburg, had problems when cows were being brought into the city from where they were naturally in the country on you know, hillsides with clean water and sunshine. And the conditions shifted where the cows no longer had pastures and they were in a bunch of mud. And what was being made in the cities but was breweries. And breweries made distillers grains and distillers mash. And that was slopped to the cows. And there was no chilling of the milk. There was no understanding of the pathogens, typhoid fever, tuber tuberculosis ran rampant. The people that milked the cows by hand in open buckets, it was so bad that they would put their feet in the warm milk because it was cold in the mornings. Oh my so God. It was a filthy, <laughs> disgusting mess. And 40% and of the people died that drank that milk during that 1880s, 70s, 1880s, 1890s period, which is about 130, 140 years ago. Well, the solution was just cook the heck out of it. Just cook it until everything died and then it would render it safe. And for the most part, that, that worked pretty good. 40% uh, fewer people died, but still had a lot of water problems where the water quality and sanitation issues weren't up to speed and people still got sick and died from the water quality issues associated with milk and other foods. So that was the beginning of the whole pasteurization concept. Before that, for 15,000 years, I mean, you could argue whether it's 12,000 or 15,000 or 20,000, but there's evidence going back to 12 or 13,000 years that mankind around the world thrived when they had a mammalian milk source because where there was green grass, sunshine, water, they had a totally whole food available to them and they didn't have to hunt fish or starve. Or, or, or farm or do anything. They had all of it right there. As long as they've had sunshine and grass and water, they were good to go. And they would store that milk and it became cheese. So we've lost the wisdom of the ages here and understanding that if you have the right conditions, raw milk is the first food of life for mammals. That defines us. Mammal, mammals being, means lactating or you know, lactation and, and nursing our young. Um, and for mankind, that means breastfeeding. For other mammals, that means, you know, udders and whatever, uh, they're young. Well, you know, I, I, I can imagine the caveman or whatever it was, uh, uh, you know, 15,000 years ago, uh, starving, having a hell of a time, and, and noticing that Iraq or that ancient cow uh, nursing its young going, well, there's milk coming out of that udder, just like my wife over here, and my <laughs> caveman wife. Well, why can't I just go? And so they domesticated these animals, reindeer, sheep, horses. Uh, camels. It was literally around the world, donkeys, um, and, and got milk from them. And that milk was a whole food that carried all kinds of miraculous things that nourished mankind. And there's well-established studies on that. But there was a train wreck in the 1800s when these cows were brought into the cities and uh, didn't eat the right things and the water quality was poor, horrible and everything else. But in 1893, something else very interesting happened. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Coit said, wait a minute, why don't we just clean up our act? You can pasteurize all you want, that's fine, but we're going to certify through the American Association of Medical Milk Commissions, the AAMMC, uh, dairymen that are going to use hygienic practices, clean the udder, chill the milk, test the milk, much as Raw Milk Institute's doing now today. And for literally 106 years until 1999, so 1893 to 1999, there was this consortium of effort internationally to produce raw milk in a sanitary method. And that milk was going to the Mayo Clinic. It was healing people. It was fantastic food. Uh, there's, there's big journals and all kinds of written, uh, written uh, research articles about that and from the 30s, 40s, 50s, about how fantastic raw milk was for healing people when they were sick or preventing it as well. But in, in 1999, Altadena, in Los Angeles was the last brand uh, to be doing raw milk under the AAMMC standards. And they sold to Dean's Foods because the real estate became so valuable in Los Angeles. They sold for millions and millions of dollars and moved there. Uh, the Stubies moved up to Oakdale, California. So that's kind of the story of why pasteurization has got a really bad black 
a mark on its uh, record, which was quite stellar for 15,000 years until the 1890s when it hit a, a real car wreck with sanitation and, and illness. So, so then people are still holding on to the, the idea that it's not safe when it was safe for the time when we were living clean. Forever, yes. And we were, we were literally living with our animals. And so our microbiomes were very much shared. Uh, there's so much of the microbiome, the genomic biome that we share with the animals we cohabitate with. We, we, we don't in our minds even have the capacity to envision that microscopically we share so much back and forth at the, at the genomic and cellular DNA level because cells cross communicate. This all, this all this research came out of the Human Genome Project where we figured out that, hey, wait, wait a minute, so much of the contribution to our genome, what makes us genetically human, comes from the bacteria that, and the viruses that actually inhabit, inhabit our bodies, not just what mom and dad gave us with 23 and me, 23,000 genes, but actually there's millions of genes that come from the bacterial load that we have and the diversity of that load that's shared at the genomic DNA level, back the crosstalk back and forth. And that actually, if you think about it, when I give lectures, I say, you know, mom and dad gave you the hardware the biome and the bacteria in your environment gave you the software. Mm. And so it's really, if you think about that, Neil, you know, Steve Jobs concept of cell phones, it doesn't do a lot unless you have a self, unless you have software in it. Uh, so we may look like what mom and dad does because the hardware was given to us with 23,000 genes, but the software that drives us genomically, which actually runs our immune system, runs metabolism, does all kinds of things, is, is really brought about by the genomics of the bacteria and uh, viruses and other, you know, the microscopic um, organisms that live in and on us that actually crosstalk that our bodies rely upon to complete our genome. And so you're saying the, the, all the microbes in the raw milk are actually very beneficial for us. Extremely so, and intentionally so. Manifestly, structurally critical. <laughs> mm. And when you think about 1930s and 40s and, and, and really the wonderful discoveries of antibiotics and saving soldiers' lives and uh, the, the wonderful passion and emotion of saving someone's life with an injection of an antibiotic, penicillin, uh, that was a fantastic, it transcended so much uh, pain and injury and loss of life that we celebrated killing bacteria. Mm -hmm. But it was indiscriminate and we didn't understand really what we were doing. Now, I'm not against antibiotics. I think they're a phenomenal tool, but they have to be reserved uh, and purposely used because we abuse them, we get antibiotic-resistant bacteria. We, we die from that. I mean, MRSA is killing people left and right. So we have to be appreciating and understanding what makes us have a strong immune system. And literally, it's 80% or more of the immune system is diversity of bacteria that have in our gut and the food that feeds it. And that is, that is madness if you were to say that in a 1980s or 1990s medical school, hmm. they would say, no, kill that stuff. It has no purpose. I don't know why it's there, but get rid of it. All it does is cause problems. Now we're starting to evolve a little bit and say, wait a minute. The human genome very much manifestly needs this diversity of bacteria. We need to be eating whole food to feed that bacteria, keep it alive and well. So we don't need an antibody, right? So we can keep our immune systems functioning and not have all these really bad diseases we're getting, um, you know, all these uh, autoimmune diseases, which are actually defined by the fact that you lost your bandwidth of your genomic data to drive your body. Your body's gone, it's gone, you know, from normal and balanced, if it ever was, into like literally, a, a, you know, a peanut in a, in a can just shaking around going crazy. It, it, it's, it's trying to um, find the information to drive itself properly. And it doesn't, it doesn't have it. So it, it really, what I'm speaking about here is very much coming out of the Human Genome Project, which was the 1990s and early 2000s, which basically said that, wait a minute, we're not alone here. We're, we're not just one person. We are literally bacterio sapiens. Hmm. And bacterio sapiens need to have a diversity of bacteria that we connect with, and they need to inhabit us. And then we need to feed them. And the, feed, the food that feeds them are whole foods. They're not preserved foods. Preserved foods, what do they do? They kill bacteria to extend shelf life. So you need to have good foods that are whole that actually nourish the diversity of good bacteria in the gut. And by the way, the good bacteria will out-dominate immensely and mutualistically in your gut competitively to assure that you re remain strong and healthy. So that diversity actually sorts itself out instead of getting these really bad, wicked bacteria that take over and make you sick. 
you actually have a diversity of bacteria which keep them all in check with the pathogenic bacteria in the minority, or even if they're present at all, uh, always kind of being suppressed by the lactobacilli and coliforms and bifidobacteria and all the wonderful bacteria. There's a whole diversity of uh, pseudomonas and all kinds of stuff that inhabit our gut that should be there that run the show. And so we're also missing the mucosal lining in our intestines have been just wickedly destroyed by antibiotics and by preservatives in our food and the GMO and uh, all the Roundup Ready stuff in the environment that we have. Um, and that mucosal lining has made us more susceptible to pathogenic injury, mm. uh, which is really quite sad because a normal, healthy human being will have a nice thick mucosal lining inside of their intestine, which is not only inoculum of all the beneficial bacteria, but also is protective. So you don't get a pathogen going in, burying itself into the tissues and causing hemolytic uremic, hemolytic uremic sy syndrome with STEC or E. coli. Um, and that, that those will go through you or be outcompeted who wouldn't actually have an ability to cause the hemolytic uremic syndrome attacking um, the, the, the actual tissues inside the intestines. So we're actually structurally uh, affected by the fact of what we've been eating and how we've been treating ourselves for the last 50, 60 years. We actually have lost some structures, which makes us, makes us immune compromised also. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's just a deep, broad concept. But to bring it back to our conversation, raw milk is the first food of life. It is the product of Mother Nature's blueprints operating on a generation by generation basis with the pressures of only the good succeeds and the bad dies off. And as a result, only the optimal first food of life would actually be propagated to nourish the young at its most immune compromised time. Just came out of the birth canal, doesn't have much of mom stuff because that stops at the placental barrier. You know, the, the umbilical cord doesn't share the same blood, right? So you, you basically transfer the immune factors through colostrum in the first two to three days after, after birth. And all the birth canal juices, all that wonderful juice from mom's birth canal are the first inoculums for the gut. And they're very rich in acidic uh, bifidobacteria and all kinds of wonderful things. And then colostrum, which is uh, packed filled with all kinds of antibodies and serum from the blood. And then that triggers the whole pitocin response, which lactation and letdown of milk, where actually lactation begins, where you actually get raw milk in the second or third day. And that is packed filled with uh, pre uh, prebiotics, uh, all the wonderful oligosaccharide sugars and all the kinds of things that are specialized to nourish the baby and also protect the baby. Uh, by the way, oligosacc oligosaccharides are very interesting sugar. They are not actually a nourishment to the baby. They're a nourishment, nourishment to specific bacteria which protect the baby. Hmm. Um, Dr. Bruce German figured that out a few years ago. I said, what's this oligosaccharide bacteria? I mean, uh, sugar, it's not digestible by the baby, but yet it's there in plentiful amounts in, 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 in raw milk. Uh, by the way, what it does is suppresses pathogens and it encourages the growth of bifidobacteria, which is so important in terms of the protective ecosystem in the gut of a baby through six or eight months. So, so much science says raw milk is a universal human food that's been around for a long time and it will build your immune system. It does three things. It nourishes completely, it protects you, and it directs stuff. Direction comes from the microRNA. What do you think the pharmaceutical companies figured out about micro, micro mRNA? It came from milk. Um, nourishing, obviously, it's got everything in there. It's got sugars and proteins and fats and everything. Um, and it is the sole food of life for the first three or four months of a baby. So it does it matter that it came from a cow instead of from, from a human? So how, how is it going to direct a human life? It's interesting in that I don't know that the direction actually works. I don't know that, the, and they're working on that now. But I do know that it's very interesting that some of the antibodies are transferable, the antibodies. Uh, the fats are a fantastic method to transfer all kinds of bioactive elements from the utter, the source of the belt to the gut, down the lower gut. What's the first thing that happens when milk is consumed? Raw milk is consumed when it hits the low pH of the one to two pH in the stomach. It curdles, it becomes cheese immediately. It becomes a coagulated big old clump, which is protective of the killing action of the acids. So that's how that you transition through the stomach to get into the lower gut, where it can actually take up and participate in the microbiome in the gut. So you're right? saying a lot of enzymes will not be destroyed because of this curdling effect. Exactly. You, you get the curdling effect. That's what you, how you make cheese. You add acid to milk and you acidify. You can use vinegar if you want. So it's very interesting how Mother Nature has protected the elements that are bioactive in milk 
to transition the upper gut, which is low pH, which is it's kind of a kill step for the body if you think about it really, um, that that transition that trans, tra transitions through the upper gut down to the lower gut, where it has very low pH, or to be higher pH and then lower pH, and actually becomes part of the, the lower gut microbiome, which is the seat of the immune system. So it's really interesting, the genius of how these wonderful bioactive elements, including alkaline phosphatase, which is destroyed in pasteurization, can transition the upper gut to go to the lower gut and actually work as an anti-inflammatory compound um, in, in the immune system. And there's all kinds of other things, uh, lactoperid oxidase and uh, lysozymes and um, bacteria, all kinds of bacteria. Some die, some don't, uh, but they're protected in this clump of cheese that your body makes when it gets to the low pH in the stomach. Hmm. So are there research showing yes. what it actually does to the body? You know, you know what are are we enriching the microbiome? Is that in actually enhancing health outcomes? So yes. what kind yes. of research? In Europe, most of these, in the United States, we have a lot of breast milk research. And the breast milk research is basically for infants and young children. So it makes sense, right? Uh, we don't have a lot of adult humans drinking female human raw milk. Uh, although that is trending, which is kind of a weird thing. But nonetheless, I'm just saying that. The, the European studies are based on children, 50, 52,000 children studied in the Parsifal study, the Gabriella study. There's some other studies that were done, like 52 of them. There's a, a huge amount of studies. Um, they are PubMed. They're all CDC and NIH listed. Um, and there's, there's not only the primary research, but follow-on research. So you have the first generation of the research in 2004 and six, and then follow-on 2010, 12, 14. Uh, and they all show uh, that children that drink raw milk have decreased significantly, 35% decrease in asthma. Very, very serious. Mm. Um, decrease in ear infections, fevers, colds, flu. All those things are associated with uh, the raw milk consumption, not all, just on the farm, but in the city as well. They broke that down mm. because the FDA really went after them ferociously and said, oh, you're talking about the farm effect of mm -hmm. all the beneficial things about being around animals. And they said, well, let's look at that. So they restudied the data that no, this study, this study showed that regardless if we were on the farm or in the city, if you consumed raw milk, you had the same benefit. They've really studied this. The raw whey protein, for instance, uh, is very stabilizing of the mast cells, which mm -hmm. release histamines, of course, and cause all kinds of inflammatory responses. Well, raw whey proteins are not present in pasteurized milk. They are present in raw milk. Uh, that was studied by um, J.P. Lyles, who's do, uh, doing kind of a takeoff on the whole uh, French paradox. And he said, it's not the wine that was so great. That was kind of an accoutrement. The, <laughs> it was the, the two kilos of cheese. And it was raw <laughs> cheese, raw cheese and the whey proteins and all these bioactive components found in raw cheese with the wine and the rest of the Mediterranean diet. They actually saw, had such a, a strong uh, anti-inflammatory or uh, non-inflammatory kind of response to the body. And that was, uh, it's all PubMed published, you, you know, stopped it. Um, yeah, I guess we don't have the French effect because in, in the US we've really barely ever experienced having raw cheese or, or raw dairy. No. We just, you know, that's what the French kept doing it, but not in the US. The French and even Quebec, Canada, uh, that area up there in Canada have been very much rebellious that they're going to keep to their French traditions and have kind of stepped out of the dairy uh, realm and bring in any kind of raw cheese they want in spite of the Canadian policy against it. So <laughs> we, we, we see blue zone effect uh, of a longevity uh, uh, surrounding the raw cheeses and these, uh, the fruits and the vegetables and the meats uh, fermented, not cured through processing and using preservatives, but rather fermentation uh, processes and salts uh, good mineral rich salts, all these naturally occurring wonderful things in sunshine and love and communication. Feeling a purpose in community was very important as well. But the blue zone, uh, you know, diet is basically kind of an organic Mediterranean diet with these things like the Kiefer, Kiefer smoothies, uh, the Balkans are part of that uh, range of, of the longevity. The centurion area in the Balkans where people in the World War I were found to live 100 years old, not have diseases or very few was because they, they had so much raw milk kefir and cheeses and all these wonderful things um, in their lives. What do you think pasteurization does besides killing off all these, you know, important little bugs? Yep. Well, here's what pasteurization does. It goes from raw to 165, 170 degrees or maybe 200 degrees back down uh, to a, a fully boil, at, let's say, 400 degrees uh, or temperature uh, or 300 degree temperature, very, very much cooked for good. 
It's non-allergenic as raw. It was very allergenic as pasteurized, and then back to non-allergenic again, it boiled. And I got that from a, an interesting slide from the International Genomics Consortium who studied the allergenicity of pasteurization. They find this curve is horrible because what it does is it puts things into partial death. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't completely sterilize. What it does is it, it uh, denatures 25, there's 2,500 different proteins, by the way, in raw milk. Uh, it denatures many of them, not all of them. It denatures many of the enzymes, but not all of them. And it kills most of the bacteria, but not all of them. So it goes like half wazies, as they say. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really get there all the way. We're completely cooking and making it into a curd, or I should say uh, uh, like a, a, a pudding or something, would, would completely in the, uh, cook it. It doesn't do that. It goes halfway. And it was intended to do that because if you cook it all the way, you don't have milk anymore. So you take it up to a point to get a five log kill, a 100,000 reduction. Of, of the worst case scenario pathogen level. And in doing that, you also kill off all the beneficial bacteria. And what pasteurization actually does is it does what's called lysing. It takes a cell and breaks open the cell content and spills out the cell guts all over the place. And it's no longer a cell. So it breaks open the cell through heat. When that happens, the cell contents are not recognized by the body as something good. You're saying there are cells in cells. the milk. Absolutely. Absolutely. What kind of cells are these? You'll find epithelial cells. You found antibodies, you find uh, bacterial cells, plenty of bacterial cells. Um, and, in, and when they're pasteurized, they're broken open. And the, the proteins are denatured, they're all tangled up, they're no longer an organized. They don't, they don't look like Lego land and anything organized. It's all a mess. It's, it's just like tangled mess. And your body reacts to that. And some people are more severe than others. And there's a whole mucus response. Histamines are released. Um, and your body says, wait a minute, get that dead stuff out of here. It's foreign to us. Uh, and causes an allergic response. Mm -hmm. And that's not to everybody. Not everybody has that, but it, it, there's, there's quite a range of, of, of allergen, allergic responses or just a reaction to get mucus going to get the dead stuff out of the body. Um, now, what's interesting about that is it also makes it hard to digest because remember that not everybody has a lactase persistent gene. Um, and even those that do can really suffer. You could you can actually stimulate or simulate or uh, propagate lactose intolerance in somebody by giving them a whole lot of antibiotics and even chemotherapy, by killing off the gut microflora, mm. which are the, that's what creates lactase. The lactobacillus is what makes lactase and other lactose consuming bacteria make lactase. That's how they do that process in the gut. So, you know, it's hard to digest, on the pasteurized side, on the raw side, what you do is you're consuming raw milk and you do it repetitively and maybe with kefir, which has very, very high levels of bacteria because it's like a, a yogurt. What you're doing is you're repopulating the communities of bacteria that are missing. So you're, you're recolonizing the gut so that when raw milk lactose comes along, the friendly bacteria down there that say, oh, I could digest you. I'm going to make myself some lactase. And no problem, because you've recolonized the gut with these beneficial bacteria, which do that job for you. But in America, um, after breastfeeding is done and you've taken your first few rounds of antibiotics, you start getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. And you're not eating a uh, biologically diverse, uh, enzyme-rich, whole, nutritionally dense food like raw milk that has the bacteria in it. You're eating something that's literally borderline sterile. You know, you, the, 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 past, the pasteurization process eliminates the beneficial bacteria and they're all gone. There's a few uh, heat loving bacteria left, a few cold loving bacteria, and they will grow over time, but they're actually quite toxic. You, you actually drink an old pasteurized dairy products and you'll go, yep, yeah, no, it's terrible. If you drink an old raw dairy product, it's actually quite sweet hmm. because it's actually bile fermented. It's, it's um, become its own ecosystem and, unto itself. It's trying to become cheese. So uh, are you saying raw milk doesn't really go bad? It just evolves. <laughs> I'm drinking just evolves. evolution. Okay. Exactly. Like and it will evolve differently in a refrigerator than it would out warm on your counter. If you leave mm -hmm. it warm on the counter, it, it evolves beautifully. It does kind of a sweet, aromatic um, kefir, if you will, a natural farmer's cheese. But if you put it in the refrigerator, different kinds of bacteria tend to flourish in the lower temperatures. They're not bad. It's just that it's going to evolve differently. Which one do you prefer? Which one tastes better? I love just fresh raw milk. Uh, I'm a lover of fresh raw milk and also of uh, properly fermented raw kefir. 
Mm. Um, it's delicious. It's incredibly fulfilling. Yeah. And it knocks out the it kind of the satiate. It's the satiation where you, you have enough fat to actually make your gut feel full without really eating a lot of calories. And mm. so you, you, you really satiate yourself with raw milk kefir, especially if you use like throw a raw egg in, or maybe, um, Hmm. Um, a, a, a good example of, of, of like avocado. Oh, um, put in berries. Berries are, fan, are fantastic antioxidants. Blueberries make yourself a wonderful little smoothie that has all these yeah. things, and you start that day off that way. Let me tell you what: you're not hungry until two o'clock in the afternoon, and your blood sugars are stable. And so you've got enough fats in there. You've got your wonderful avocados in there. You've got all these great things. Throw some, throw some um, mushrooms in if you want. You do all kinds of things because. The, the the sweetness of the milk and the sweetness of the berries, you can throw a little raw honey if you wanted, uh, makes it just delicious like a milkshake, but is extremely nutrition dense. And that's kind of one of the secrets a lot of influencers are doing is that they're making their own specialized raw milk kefir smoothie. Mm, I see. Amazing. And I saw yeah. you guys just posted this ice cream recipe. Yeah. And I, I, it's sort of not exactly what I'm doing, but I, I do use your raw milk and I mix with the uh, frozen fruits yes. and I add all kinds, you know, mushroom powders and antioxidants, but you guys are adding raw milk. I mean, uh, raw eggs, and then you're stirring it up and with some vanilla. So many of the things that um, practitioners are, are putting into the mix are not actually enzymatically active because they've been pasteurized. And, and what's interesting about raw milk is it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a, it, it synthesizes things. It, it uh, facilitates the bioactivity because it's alive. So the bacterial action, the enzymatic action, the raw fats, all these kinds of things kind of makes it come alive in the compost in your gut because it, nothing's dead. It's all alive. It's bioactive. And so your compost pile gets a whole new lease on life um, and these things that have been rendered uh, fairly inert through uh, whatever processing it is to put it in a pill or in a bottle actually have a chance of being bioavailable because mm -hmm. bioavailability is what's really key to absorbing and utilization. Yeah. So are you saying if somebody has lactose intolerance, if they just keep on drinking a little bit of raw milk and gradually they could become completely tolerant? I actually don't put lactose intolerance diagnoses on people anymore. Hmm. I believe it's pasteurization intolerance. Wow. The human condition has no problem with natural foods, including whole natural raw milk, has never had a problem with that. It has been literally the last hundred years and the manifest combination of pasteurization plus antibiotics and plus sterilized foods and plus uh, preservatives Think about the gut microbiome. Think about the communities of bacteria needed to make lactase. So if you think about the gut microbiome, it all makes sense. It's very simple, an extremely complex way of thinking, but it's very simple. So um, I have a friend from, uh, he's a Maasai warrior from Kenya. Hmm. He drank raw milk directly out of the udder of a cow. If he hadn't done that, he would have died as an infant. He sucked directly in the teeth. He didn't have a mom to suckle on, so he suckled on a cow. Hmm. And he came to America, strong, healthy guy, lion fighter, went to Stanford University, graduated with uh, Kelsey, Chelsea Clinton. His name is uh, Camille. And he got a hell of a case of Crohn's disease because he couldn't drink the pasteurized milk. And he went to soy milk, which really ran him off the rails. And he got a case of Crohn's disease by the time he was in the early 20s because he came here at like 18, 19 years old. And it was interesting how his gut was just completely destroyed by the American food because he was eating junk food. He really didn't have any idea about nutrition, even though the Maasai have a pretty distinct nutritionally dense food, uh, very close to the earth. But he did not have that in his brain at all. And he went down the, he went down the, the Cheetos, you know, Doritos hole. Um, <laughs> and so he, he, his gut was shot. I got to know him through a movie uh, producer in LA. He said, you got to meet this guy. So I met him and we talked about raw milk and he realized what he'd grown up on. I gave him eight gallons of raw milk a week for free for a year, delivered it in our trucks in San Francisco area. And he fully recovered from his Crohn's disease and he was gonna have surgery to have literally feet of his intestines removed and have poop in a plastic bag uh, with an ileostomy. And he recovered from that. And his quote to me was, I may live in California, but I eat in Kenya. So that mm -hmm. was kind of an interesting thing. And I've got plenty of friends that are you know, Asian that mm -hmm. had, pretty significant uh, lactose intolerance issues. But remember the Mongolians are Asian. 
mm-hmm. they drink mare's milk like crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's fermented raw milk. So that's like our keeper. So I am of the belief that there may be a lactase persistent gene, but you know what? Raw milk is for everybody everywhere because it is a whole food that will recolonize the gut of whoever consumes it. And I'm not seeing an exception to that. Um, there's even some science studies done at Stanford University showing the HPD, the hydrogen breath test curve, going like this and going down after two weeks of consuming raw milk. Yes, initially they had a problem. And then it got better until colonization after two weeks mm. was actually pretty full. And the HPT hydrogen was no longer being created because colonization was uh, at least enough to create enough lactase that things are good. So this whole idea, I think it's, it's actually quite inhumane to say you have a problem when the food has the problem. Wow. What a powerful story. That's yeah. incredible. Uh, and the implication of what doctors can do to heal their patients. Huge, so, so, huge. Because huge. they were cutting people's gut off, right? So I have a website called farmersoverpharmacies.com. Farmersoverpharmacies.com. Mm. And on there, I think I have 12 videos there. I haven't done a video in a couple of years, but I interview people who recovered their gut from very significant. I mean, they were going to have surgery within literally two weeks. And they were like emotionally and broken down mess saying, I don't want my intestines taken from my body. Mm. I don't want to poop in a plastic bag, right? I'm a young, vital person. I have a life to live. I have to do something. And they literally discovered deep nutrition. And through either a practitioner or a friend or whatever, they found a way to actually do the, a, a Mediterranean diet with lots of olive oils and, and um, uh, stews and broths, bone broths. They're very collagen rich. Lots of raw milk kefir, uh, never an antibiotic. And they were on their medications at the same time. But then after four or five months, their symptoms went away and they stopped their medications mm. and they were fine. Mm. So it's all about the gut microbiome, inflammation in the gut. And what's tragic about this is the medical schools, not all of them, I'm not going to blame every medical school for this, but most of them I'm aware of say there's no cure, eat whatever you want and take the medications. And I think that that is a disservice to humanity. I really do. Yeah, just look at all the hospitals. Um, everybody that's going through treatments, um, pretty sick, and they're fed a very inflammatory diet. So that you know, shows most, you their philosophy. The most disruptive thing that's happened in the last 15 years or 20 years in medicine that I'm aware of, that I think is really extremely disruptive, but constructive, C. diff patients dying left and right in the ICU, C. diff, cost me to get the seal. And then the doctor saying, wait a minute, we can save a life here and going to a young nurse who has a fantastic diet and good health and taking her feces mm. and flushing the lower gut of these patients. And 92% of the time, they're okay in two days. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a drug. It wasn't surgery. It wasn't some fancy thing. It was literally a fecal transplant. What does that say? What does that mean? What is that? Where, is that, where do you put the headspace? I think that is an incredibly revealing discovery of nature's blueprints. Yeah, and, yeah. And how and how the, the contents of your intestines can drive the inflammation of your intestines, which drives your health and even sepsis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting you're going to bring somebody back from extreme sepsis. I'm not going to go there. But but the bottom line is people are dying left and right in the ICU with C. diff. And 92% of the time, that's nine out of 10 patients walk away. That's incredible. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Yeah. I know that, that I think it, it definitely now everybody, even, you know, people who are not very aware about, uh, you know, holistic health or good nutrition, they, they know the word microbiome. So now I can say the word microbiome and not, you know, have people, you know, you know, like deer in the headlight. Um, right. yeah. So, so that's a huge change. It is. Yeah. Boy, what an important one. But now we need to have a follow on support of the microbiome. We need to say, how do you take care of your dear, dear friend, your microbiome that makes up 90% of your immune system and 90% of your genomics? How do you take care of that? How do you, how do you nourish it? How do you love it? How do you feed it? How do you protect it? That is really where medicine needs to go because right now, in 1962, 6% of our GMP was in medical care. Now it's exceeding 20%. So that's telling you the pharmaceutical industry has get, got Congress by the short hair, getting all the money. And, and, and we've really taken your medical schools and just gone, kill it, cut it out, 
cure it through some chemical. And, and we're not going in the right direction very well because 6% to 20%, we're consuming more and more of our, our gross national uh, chest of and our, our, our gold, our gold, um, our value, our wealth into something that's actually illness. So in illness care versus wellness or prevention care. And, you know, prevention is not very exciting because you're not sick yet. <laughs> but you know what? Who wants to be sick? But we're not teaching in schools to prevent illness through whole nutrition. We, we may be trying to start to do that, but the food chain is so dominated by the political forces of processors saying, I'm going to have my part of the USDA food pyramid come hell or high water, you know, and, instead of what's better for humanity. And I, I think we have a we have to change our social contract with the, the citizens of our country and say, what's best for you? Not what's yeah. best for the pharmaceuticals or, or doctors or medical schools. Or, no, what's best for people? And that will roll out very nicely into what's best, best for everybody uh, in the food chain. It'll be a lot better for farmers, too, because farmers will be very much the principal place that food comes from. It doesn't necessarily get processed very much. Yeah. You know, just when you were talking about uh, preventative medicine, I had a flashback of me back in medical school. And I remember thinking preventative medicine, you, that, that sounds so boring. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and like, whatever, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that, that's how I felt at that yes. time. Right. Yes. Be yes. Because, you know, like, like, you, like what you're going to do something so people don't get sick. Yeah. You know, that just is it, definitely not exciting. And, uh, but then, you know, I'm trying to stay healthy and that's when I'm like, I'm going to prevent, I'm going to prevent for myself. And then I realize, oh my God, this is very powerful. So why, you know, I should be doing this for everybody. So nobody gets sick. So now really what I'm doing is preventive medicine. Everything yes. I'm doing is trying to, yes. you know, me being in the anti-aging field to prevent yes. aging, which is the biggest risk factor for diseases. So, because exactly. aging is nothing but decline and, exactly. and all the malfunction that we could address along the way. That, that can't be overstated. And it's just not popular because it doesn't make money. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't create money. And, and think about it, as a doctor, I, I, you know, I was a paramedic for 17 years. So I worked with a lot of doctors. I got a lot of pre-med behind me. I'm not a doctor. My wife's got her master's in nursing. And so we do a lot of work together. But you know, in, 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 in medical school, you run up a big debt. You run two or $300,000 in debt in some places or, or that more. And then you work really long hours and you're exhausted as an intern and a resident. And it's like, I got to make some damn money here. I was promised a decent quality of life and I'm in debt and I'm not making any money. I'm a slave to some hospital and residency. I'm not making more than a nurse next to me. There's kind of a internal anger saying, I, I, I was supposed to save humanity and be good. And now it becomes, a, I got to survive myself as a doctor to pay back my bills and make some money. And so you become a churn, you become a, 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 you know, seven minutes per patient kind of a thing where you're just diagnosing, treating, get them out of here, diagnose, treat, build, you know, instead of looking at a group of people you're responsible for to make sure they're the healthiest they can possibly be. Yeah. Um, thinking of that as a goal versus just treat the worst, treat the worst, treat the worst, bill, bill, bill. It's a different mind culture. Um, and I'm a big proponent of single payer and, and socialized medicine in some regards. I think there's some really good things there. Um, and it's so much more efficient if you're not paying profits to the middle, uh, the insurance companies to just scalp and deny, deny, deny. Um, and it'd be so much better to say, wait a minute, guys, what's the end goal here? The end goal is to be an efficient country with healthy people that aren't getting sick. So we can be more productive and less supportive of that 30% of people are in hospitals or in convalescent homes or wherever they are, um, always supporting the ill versus preventing that. We can all be more productive for 70 years of our lives and enjoy every bit of it with quality of life towards the end versus quality of life falling apart at 45 or 50. People so, are definitely waking up, but um, I still see a lot of people who are stuck in the, in the old ways and they <clears throat> believe in everything the doctor's saying and then they they do what the doctors say so and then they keep on suffering um so it just uh because that's the wrong direction you need to take control of your own health you know right. i i, I remember t telling somebody um you know this philosophy even when, when i was in medical school I, I thought it was ludicrous maybe because i came from a chinese culture in medical school they said you as a doctor you're going to become a doctor. Once you become a doctor, you should never attempt to treat yourself or your family. It's as if I'm going to be so blinded by my love for my family that I can't think straight. I can't, I can't do the right things. Okay, so I have to give 
my autonomy up and go to somebody else and tell everything about myself to that person so that person can understand who I am and then give me the right things. I'm never going to be able to spill out everything about myself to that person. There's nobody that knows myself better than myself. Yeah. And to say that I'm a doctor, so I should never write medications for myself and I should never write medications for my patients. That just shows you the philosophy of this, the whole medical system in this country. It takes your autonomy away. It doesn't give you, it doesn't respect that you have the intelligence to take care of your own body. Correct. And, and that's got to change. And, and and it is changing. But it was, it I can tell you, the, the, I, but right away, I thought this is, this is madness. <laughs> like, I can't treat myself now because I know too much and I'm just going to yeah. be blind. Well, give yourself a little credit and give yourself a little grace for yourself because you've come through a process to give you a license to speak. Uh, you have That's the right, right to practice medicine. That means you've, you, you've arrived at that pub med level of, uh, you know, you're, you're clear to go in terms of practicing medicine. Oh, That's, I knew I had to finish medical school for a yes. good reason. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and that is a distinction that's highly honorable and respectable and fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, okay, everybody, let's really look at the science. What does the science actually say? What's the microbiome say? What does PubMed say about really what the leading pioneering stuff going on right now will be very supportive of everything you're saying. Mm. But we're not, a, a great example is I'm not allowed to put any PubMed links on our website at Raw Farm. That is ludicrous. That's insane. Yes. That's crazy because that means <laughs> that none of our, con our consumers can ever connect good science with practice. They can never put together the math between food is medicine. Well, just like a lot of rules from the higher ups, um, it's not even making sense. No. But then there were people say, well, they're trying to protect, protect us. So everything they say, then we believe. Yeah, I would like these organizations to explain their policy. Like Thank what you. could be any you know plausible reason that this could be even a reasonable uh you know stipulation like why what just just like for example i don't understand why stem cell therapy the moment you talk about the cells being alive <laughs> then you are speaking of the metabolic activity of the cells and that means the cells become a drug and then right. you have to conduct clinical studies. So right. this is no longer tissue transplant. Uh, what? Yeah. Well, uh, explain that to me. I've been sued by the FDA for putting PubMed, CDC, NIH links to European studies, and a lot of them, because I was creating a new drug by, by suggesting that this science applied to our milk, and uh, therefore people could get better. Okay. All right. That's, that's FDA cleared, PubMed. NIH, CDC links, not mine, theirs. Yeah. And so I guess I'm a new drug guy. That's pretty interesting. So we actually are facing the same battles, you know? Yes, Go we figure. are. You we with are. milk and me with stem cells. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when you say stem cells because Ramak has stem cells in it. Hmm. And it's like, well, that's very interesting that mother nature would have stem cells in raw milk. First food of life. Stem cells, okay. We know that the digestive tract of a baby is very immature. The pH isn't the same as an adult. And uh, the digestive process, the, the leaky gut is very permeable to absorb antibodies that it wouldn't later in life. All kinds of interesting things. But uh, Mother Nature's blueprints are, in my opinion, kind of the, the um, really good reference point to understand so much more about what we about health and about uh, well-being because of the, the, the blueprints that have, for a million years have evolved telling us this is the way you've got to do it or you've died off if you didn't. Um, and that's why I really hang out with these really smart PhDs at the IMGC because they talk about this all the time and it brings so much logic to such an incredibly vast, incomprehensible infinity of, of information. It brings logic to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. This is such a fun conversation. So before we wrap up, I want to ask you something because, sure. okay, this is a common suggestion by holistic doctors. They tell patients, if you want to be healthy, you got, you got to avoid gluten and dairy. You've heard that over and over, right? Avoid gluten and dairy. I was like, no, I love cheese. 
that that's that's the, one of the worst sacrifices, you know. So, okay, I want you to explain about so you you know obviously you're going to talk about the pasteurization sure. process. Sure. Sure. So, what does the pasteurized milk when when that gets made into a cheese? So we know about the the pasteurized milk, and what about the cheese that came from pasteurized milk? Well, it's no longer bioactive. The enzymes are denatured. The proteins have been changed. So, yeah, there's casein there. Yeah, there's protein there, but it's no longer as it's not alive. When a a holistic doctor is saying get off gluten and get off dairy, it makes sense if you think about it. They mm -hmm. have been trained about raw milk. They're trained about dairy as a pasteurized product, which is highly allergenic. And you're also dealing with patients that have leaky gut. Most of them have leaky gut because the permeability is so high in the intestines because the mucosal lining is missing. And you got all these pyrus patches that are wide open in the intestines and things are being absorbed in the bloodstream that shouldn't be there. So you have all these gluten sensitivities, all these kinds of weird things you would not have, generally speaking, if your intestinal lining was intact and your, your junctions were tight and you had a mucosal lining that worked, you had biodiversity and the digestive process functioned. So what they're doing is they're looking at all the patients that are coming to them and seeing leaky gut syndrome and saying, don't eat things that get in your bloodstream. And these are the worst of them, gluten and dairy. Well, what we're saying is rebuilding mucosal lining using raw dairy. Mm -hmm. That's, by the way, not allergenic. And you will then start to transcend the problems you have into a place where your gut intestinal structure is correct. And you'll have these uh, mucosal linings and the biodiversity. And uh, also, you know, there's, there's prebiotics, which is the food that feeds bacteria. There's probiotics, the bacteria themselves, and the diversity of them. And then there's postbiotics. And postbiotics are basically the metabolites, the poop of the bacteria. Mm. But that stuff is critical to building blocks, and it's there for a reason. Uh, other bacteria use it to build things, and your body uses it to build things. Really, really, really important. And, and raw milk has all three of those things. Um, and it just takes time. It took a while to get to where you are. It's going to take a while to get back. Hmm. Um, and so I would, I would strongly suggest people to say whole foods, whole foods, nothing added, short ingredient lists, like three things, love milk. And that's it. You know, it just, that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to have very short, nothing you can't pronounce, mm -hmm. uh, nothing you exactly. can't, you have to look up very yeah. short. And, and really, really things that would rot if you left it in the sun. You know, you need to eat things that you're, the rat would eat. Mm. You, you actually have to eat things that are digestible and whole, nutrient dense. Do so. you think raw cheese uh, has additional benefits compared to raw milk? Uh, no, uh, no. The reason I say that is because raw cheese is not all the things found in raw milk. You're missing a lot of the whey. There's curd and there's whey, and they're separated. And what you're getting is just the, the casein, the curd part. And the whey proteins are actually lost in the whey stream. And in the old days, that whey would be collected and consumed. Uh, either as a lactate, they would be using it for uh, fermenting vegetables. You would take your, your vegetables and soak them in whey protein, or that whey was fed to the, the hogs, and then you eat the hogs later. So uh, raw cheese is, is, uh, is part of raw milk, but it's not the whole. Hmm. Uh, raw milk has whey proteins, casein proteins, and all kinds of other things in there that are all complete and whole um, in fats. Where raw cheese has the fat, some of it, has some of the proteins, yes. It's got the enzymes, yes. It's got some of the bacteria, but the raw whey protein, which is highly beneficial, is mostly gone uh, missing because uh, in the cheese making process, it's taken off. Hmm. What about kefir? Do, are you getting all the benefits? Yes. <laughs> okay. All the benefits times 50. <laughs> Amazing. Remember, you're not losing anything. There's nothing being lost, and, and there's no whey protein loss. It's all there. It's all bioavailable. It's semi-digested already for you with the pH drop down to the fours from six and a half. So it's acidic. Uh, it's semi-digested. It's extremely biodiverse, extremely bio-intensive um, in terms of the bacteria count. You're talking about 10 to 15 million bacteria per milliliter, where raw milk may have 500 to 1,000. Mm. So you really have a diversity of bacteria, which have had a, a time to actually relax and eat and ferment over 36 hours at body temperature, let's say 85 degrees, room temperature. Mm -hmm. And as a result, extremely biodiverse, extremely uh, digested already for you. Um, and it's it's a superfood. It really is. Yeah. In fact, if you, if you look at the history of mankind, I would propose that most people drank raw keeper, not raw milk, because... Mm -hmm. 
if you collected the milk into a dirty container, let's say a gourd or a container from last week that wasn't washed very well, that would be the inoculum to start getting the bacteria to grow in that warm milk. And there wasn't really good chilling. So the milk sat around on a table, was consumed raw and fresh for a few hours. And then by the afternoon of the next morning, it was very much turning into like a yogurt or a kefir. Hmm. So raw milk by the farmer, yeah, he probably drank raw milk. But his neighbor or people down the road or something, that was something that was fermented because it was not chilled rapidly and it had the inoculum from the dirty container. So, uh, you know, it also has a very long shelf life. You could take kefir and you could drink it, you know, leave it at, at, at room temperature for a few days or weeks. Uh, if you cool it, it'll last for months, but uh, mm. it, it, it's a living food. And mm. if you really get bored with it, you put it through cheesecloth and you have farmer's cheese. Mm. So the curd yeah. can be strained out as farmer's cheese, and then the whey protein can be consumed or can be used for ferment fermentation of vegetables. So our great grandparents could have told us all about this, but we forgot about that part. Yeah. What about a raw cream? Does that have significant nutritional value? Yes. The butterfat globule carries 60% or more of the bioactive elements found in raw milk. The anti-inflammatory compounds found in raw milk are carried on the butterfat. Oh, wow. So raw milk has, let's say, 4% butterfat. We run 4 to 4.5% butterfat through the year, depending on what time of the year. So it's got 4.5% of the weight of the milk is actually being, it's carrying bioactive elements like uh, alkaline phosphatase and that kind of stuff, really cool stuff. Cream is 40% butterfat. Mm. Wow. You talk about 10x happy. You've got 10x <laughs> more of the good stuff that's bioactive, mm -hmm. that's anti-inflammatory. In fact, you find a lot of people getting uh, a lot of healing from raw cream because of the anti-inflammatory components found that actually help a lot with arthritis. Oh my God, that's amazing. What a delicious way to heal your Yes, <laughs> whipped cream, whipped cream with your vegetable, with your uh, whipped, whipped cream with uh, some raw honey and maybe some uh, berries. Oh my gosh, that's delicious. Butter is 86% raw fat. Oh. So you talk about... <laughs> 4% to 80%, that's 20X. So incredibly dense in terms of anti-inflammatory factors. Uh, children do really, really well because of the butyric acid that's created in the lower gut. That's actually very, very important for inflammation and, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of children on a spectrum do really, really well because it's brain food. Uh, mm. The fats are super important for the neurons and, and the, the, the swan cells and all that stuff. That the insulation... Uh, the, the good cholesterols are missing or are lower in some of these children. And boy, it goes directly to the brain. It really helps out with inflammation as well as rebuilding the uh, the neurons. Wow. Powerful and fat, delicious. That's where it's at. <laughs> that's where it's at. As long as it's good fat, um, it's, it's a phenomenal. In fact, our ancestors would have really shown uh, the fat dominant part of their diets, along with good proteins and of course, vegetables mm -hmm. and everything else. But um, yeah, fat is really critical. And, and I think in raw milk, the fat is one of the most critical elements. That's amazing. Yeah. So maybe uh, tell people where they can uh, get these amazing <laughs> raw milk products. Well, joy, it's been a joy because it's been an entire hour and I haven't been bored one second and this has been <laughs> invigorating as hell. So thank you. But um, in California, you can get go to Sprouts and you go to website at rawfarmusa.com. We have a, a locator map to find the closest raw milk to you. And it's all the way from the Mexican border, the Oregon border, east, west, north, south. It's everywhere. We have 600 stores and we are the number one selling brand in those stores, um, even though we're more expensive and it costs a lot more for raw milk because all the safety and testing and all those things we have to do. But um, it's a number one selling brand of fluid milk in those in those stores. Amazing. Amazing. So yeah. do all the states um, have availability? No. no. Okay. No. In fact... Every state has sovereignty to do what they want with raw milk. There are currently 21 states that allow the sale of raw milk in some way. And then the other 30 states or so, it's either illegal or you have to buy, buy a part of a cow or go to the farm and buy the raw milk directly from the farmer. But uh, I'm very proud to say that the Raw Milk Institute, which I'm part of, uh, just helped get uh, raw milk legalized in Iowa. Mm. And it was completely illegal before. And we worked very, very hard with trained farmers that we trained there to produce safe raw milk. They used our standards in their legislation. So it's very powerful. And we also worked with farmers in Montana um, to uh, kind of bring them up to speed on how to produce raw milk well. Uh, this last summer, we spent time up there. So remember, there's two intentions. One intended for pasteurization, and you can do whatever you want because it's going to get cooked. You don't really care if it's got a little poop in it. But <laughs> raw milk intended for people, you have to have a farmer that's ethical. It's going to work hard. It's going to do a great job of cleaning the udder 
uh, cleaning the, all the equipment, make sure it's in well-maintained, chilling them out quickly and testing it. So you have integrity and knowledge that in fact, it's not filled with a bunch of E. coli or something. Uh, mm. We test for every pathogen every day. Mm. And none gets out of our food chain here at our farm or the creamery without a negative certificate of analysis from food safety net in Fresno. So we have our act together when it comes to food safety integrity, and we're pioneers in that uh, nationally and internationally. We've trained farmers in Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, all across Canada, the United States. And we're world, world leaders in that whole issue because raw milk is a powerful food. But for those with weakened immune systems, if there's a pathogen present, it can make them sick. We do not want that. And when you do these practices well, you don't get that. You get very powerfully immune, strong, happy, healthy people. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, so just one, I'm just curious. So uh, I assume a lot of the English speaking countries will have similar hangups about, you know, needing to stick to pasteurized milk. And uh, and, and other countries, I, I'm not sure if they're, because a lot no, of people, no, a lot of countries- I have a, I have a story that will fix, it'll answer this question perfectly. We sell a lot of raw milk at farmer's markets in Los Angeles, Santa Monica farmer's market and other farmer's markets. And I would go down there quite a bit, especially in the first 10 years. And you would hear a strong accent, a Russian accent, um, a German accent, some Eastern Europe block. And they'd come up and say, I need 10 gallons, please. Thank you. And they have beautiful children. And the moms are sexy, beautiful things. They, you know, they're, they're beautiful. And their teeth are gorgeous. And the kids are, are, are well-behaved and gorgeous. And I was like, here you go, ma'am. Thank you so much. And then you get another mom that's not looking so great coming in with her ragamuffins behind her. And she goes, you know, I'm not so sure about this raw milk thing. I said, well, why don't you talk to this Russian gal and you guys straighten it out and come back to me and talk to me? Because it literally is a indoctrinization in our culture. Because in Russia, Bulgaria, all the Eastern Bloc, raw milk has been part of their lives forever. It's never been something that's been shunned. It's been something that, that's been embraced. Mm -hmm. uh, in Mexico, um, it, until the last 20 years, it's been very much embraced as well. South America, the same. Um, but the first world nations have literally been dominated by the commercialization of milk through pasteurization. And that happened literally circa World War II or just before World War II, where, you know, you could, you could fix all the problems with nuclear bombs and DDT and smoking was good for your lungs. <laughs> that was World War II, right? Uh, <laughs> now we're realizing that there's nuances to this and Mother Nature's blueprints in the biome and smoking is not good for your lungs and, uh, you know, moderation and alcohol and you know, all the things. Uh, we're starting to realize and appreciate that we have to take care of our microbiome and our the mother mm -hmm. within. And so if we abuse her, we'll have a shortened life and a miserable life, and it's not going to be so good. Yeah. Well, thank you for your amazing contribution to humanity, you know, to bring back this incredible healing food to, to, to the world. I feel really, really privileged with purpose. And I my grandchildren are thriving because they're all descendants of what we're doing here and are, are drinking raw milk and doing all the things and eating other whole foods and being well educated. And I'm also extremely proud of you and the work you've done with stem cells and the work you've done and coming from China and going to Berkeley and doing all the things you've done and, and being a phenomenal leader and inviting me on your show, which is a privilege. Thank you very, very much. It's been super fun. I just love all the knowledge you're sharing and, and uh, yeah, what a great conversation. So thank you so much. And I'm sure the audience will just really, really find this valuable and, and hopefully start to you know enjoy some raw milk products which is I hope so too is the first really thing people yeah. the first thing people say on a poll about raw milk is it's delicious that's the yes. first thing they say yes <laughs> yes i always have them in my refrigerator so enjoy and enjoy thank good you. health thank you dr kong thank you